Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Gleb Bakhmutov from Cyprus. I live in Boston. I work at Cyprus remotely. And I will talk about the state of art in end-to-end -end testing. But before I do that, I have to talk about very, very something important. Our planet is in immediate, imminent danger, like the heat waves during the summer, Arctic without sea ice, burning California right now, uh, India, Bangladesh running out of water. The system is broken. And imagine the heat wave that you experience during the summer lasting for one month. It kills all the crops. What's your plan? What's your plan for melting Arctic and the sea rising 50 meters? And I'll tell you, there is no fucking plan. So I'm trying to act and change my behavior today. So I only have one son. I cutting down on flying. I only use public transportation, try to eat less meat, solar farm, so on. And I'm trying to tell everyone to do the same because we can all influence ourselves and our immediate family and coworkers. And finally, you have to affect the way the government acts. In the United States, I'm trying to lobby for carbon pricing because I think we have technology to change our lives today. And the only thing stopping from changing and averting the global climate catastrophe is the fossil fuels but trying to squeeze one more dollar before we all die. Here's my pledge. Here's my email, Twitter. If you're working on profit or non-profit organization that tries to change our climate and solve it, I will help you for free. I volunteer to help you with testing. It's always hard to kind of switch back from that theme, but it's serious. OK, testing is a drag. It slows you down. Oh, thank you. <laughs> testing is a drag. It slows you down. While you're writing tests, you cannot actually do features that you get paid for. And testing doesn't pay. It's like scaffolding. You have to build it in order for you to finish the building, but then you have to remove it because you're not selling the scaffolding. And finally, testing is boring. And I'm surprised so many people actually picked me because I would expect everyone to be at a different uh, stage. In this presentation, I will tell you how I personally avoid writing tests and how I pick which tests to write and how to make it fun. So I have a lot of open source projects, a lot of blog posts, I do run engineering at Cypress, so if you go on GitHub, give it a star. Every day I'm working on test runner, coding every day. These slides are available on slides.com. And finally, if you want to argue with me or praise me, I'm on Twitter as well. So why are we writing tests? Well, personally, I know that I write shitty code. Every time I write something, it's not going to work. I know that in any language for any platform. I know it's not going to work on a second try or third try. So the only reason I write tests is because I know myself. So the simplest way for me to actually prove myself correct is not to write tests, but do a lint check. So in this case, I'm adding to VS Code, TS check, and immediately it shows me, hey, you messed up. Here's an error. There are a couple of linters. So I usually talk about linting pyramid. At the bottom, we have prettier. Pretty reformats your JavaScript code so it looks uniform, easy to read. It's not an actual linter, but it makes te uh, the test or your production code easier to read and easier to understand and for bugs not to hide there. Then you have ESLint. This is an actual linter. It understands the structure of your code and it can tell you you're using a variable that you have not declared. It probably is a mistake. And even above it is things like TS check, but actually use type information to test my code and tell me if something's wrong. And you can get all the benefits of TypeScript checks without writing TypeScript. So here's how you do it. You start with your regular JavaScript code, let's say a function add, and you write a comment. I know, a comment. Kind of weird, right? But in that comment, you can say, First parameter is a number, and second parameter is a number, and immediately you get benefits. Because if you hover over the function every time you use it, there is an IntelliSense pop-up that tells you, hey, this is what this function does. But it also can underline and tell you, hey, you are trying to pass a string, and this function expects a number. So you're doing something wrong. You can actually set it up as a pre-compiled step where it will type check all your JavaScript code and tell you all the places 
but you're calling function incorrectly. But this brings me to my biggest pet peeve with every project I've been on. Nobody writes comments, even when comments are that useful. So when we were working on our comments for Cypress, we made a decision that every method that the API exposes should be well documented. So anytime you try to write tests, you can hover over, let's say, type, and it tells you, here's what type does. Here's an example. Here's a link to actually find more documentation where we spend a lot of time writing docs for every command, because we know it's very, very important. I was thinking, why is it important? And I realized that I actually make more mistakes not even writing my own code, but more mistakes using someone else's code, or more mistakes even using my own code. So here's the situation. I write something, and I don't, do, I don't document it enough. I have confusing API. Maybe I have options that don't make sense, that are not named correctly. So 10 developers try to use that library. They all make mistakes. They all have to submit an issue, look at the code. And so what have I achieved? I became a 10x developer, which is my goal. But it's negative 10. I just slow down 10 developers by writing bad code without examples. No one should be an Einstein to actually use your library. No one should look at the code and know the whole system just to fix a small issue. Please, make nice abstractions, document them, to make yourself more productive. So use static types, linting, and please use more examples. I love looking at examples. When people talk about testing, they usually talk about testing pyramid, and they argue till they're blue in the face about types of tests to write. Should I write more unit tests because they're faster, or should I write more end-to-end -end tests because they're more productive? And I say, forget about all of that. Like, stop arguing about testing pyramid. If you're writing code, you should test it. If you're writing API, you should test it. If you're writing a web application, you should test it. It doesn't matter how you call the test. It has to be a test. There's only a test, and only the thing that you doubt works. If your thing is a function, and you're not sure if it works or not, you write a test. If your thing is a component, in this case, a React component, you write a test. In this case, Cypress can mount this component and interact with component, and you can run it, and it looks kind of like this, where you can see how your component reacts to events that you're sending. If your thing is an API, well, there is a plugin that I've written where you can call your API with given arguments, inspect back results, maybe even show log messages from the server side. I don't care how you call the test. I call it a test. If your thing is a complete web application, when you write a Cypress test, where you visit the site and you ex exercise that site, you drive it just like a real user. So if your thing is not a web application itself, but the style, the CSS, the visual appearance of a, uh, your web app, you write a test. You just add plugins from other libraries that do visual diffing. So in this case, if someone submits a pull request and the pull request changes the SVG fields, style color to something else, well, that test can tell you pizza that used to be yellow now got a green crust. Is that what you wanted? And you probably will say no. Tomorrow, Gil Tayar will show how he does visual diffing and visual testing. So make sure not to miss his presentation. He's an excellent presenter. If your thing is not a web application and not its style, but its accessibility, you write a test. In that test, you can inject very popular X accessibility testing library and just check everything. For example, in this case, a color contrast. And it will tell you, hey, you cannot read it, right? Because the color contrast is so low. So the test will tell you your website doesn't pass accessibility test. You can always write a test. It's just a question is, picking a right plugin that tests the thing that you're trying to prove works. With Cypress, we created a platform where people can write in JavaScript plugins but do all sorts of different things, more than we actually imagined. There are two things that people ask me about testing. What should I test? And how long should my test be? 
So what should I test? There are a couple of ways you can say you have to write new tests or the tests are duplicate. You can do it manually, carefully collect user stories, and for each user story, write an end-to-end -end test. But the thing that makes it difficult is that you have to maintain this one-to-one -one relationship as you add features or modify features or even deprecate features. For example, with Todo MVC, you can say, well, what does it do? Well, feature A, user can add to do items. Okay, users can complete to do items. And users can delete to do items. Excellent. So we have three features, and we'll tr keep track of them manually. So we can write a test, and we'll take the feature name as the test name. So it adds to those is a test. It completes to those is a test. And then we can think, oh, wait, none of my test is named delete to those. So we write one more test. And it's a very simple example, but I think in general it's a very hard system to maintain. Because it's easy to match one test to one feature, but once you start writing a couple more features, more tests, it becomes harder, and after a while, you just get swamped. You cannot maintain this thing manually. I don't know what happened there. Like, this is weird. <laughs> OK, so we need an alternative. Alternative is to automate this uh, feature mapping to tests. We can collect code coverage. We can instrument our application code so we know which lines of code we executed during the test. So imagine you starting to implement this app, and you say, feature A, users should be able to add items. So you write some code, and then you implement the second feature, and you write some more code. You maybe change old code. And then you implement the last feature, which also adds code. And then you run end-to-end -end tests. And because your code is already instrumented, you can tell which lines of code those tests touched. In this case, Martin Green, and the rest is red. And you're like, oh, the red lines are features that I have not tested. And you play Sherlock Holmes, and you figure out what tests to write. And you write one more test, and now you're covering all the lines. So that's how code coverage works. And it's not direct measurement, right? Because it's indirect measurement. You know that those features are implemented in code. And you know this code gets executed when you run those tests. And people strive to get 100% code coverage. But it doesn't mean that once you get to 100% code coverage, that you'll have zero bugs. But one problem is that your code might not actually implement the features correctly. You can still cover the code, but that code is doing the wrong things. And the second problem is that your end-to-end -end test cases might be unrealistic. Yes, they're covering the code, but for example, they use very simple email. So if a user uses a realistic email, your, your code might not actually work. So 100% code coverage doesn't guarantee zero bugs. So for Cypress, we have written a code coverage plugin where you instrument the code, which is very easy to do, and then that plugin does the rest. Here's how it works. You write your test. It's a single end-to-end -end test where the user visits the site, finds the input box, types free to do's, and then checks that there are free to do's in a list. And we found that end to end tests like this one are extremely efficient at covering a lot of application source code in a single test. This one test, if you look at the report, covers 72.5% of all application code. Just a single test, because the whole application has to load, initialize, start processing events. And then the code coverage. And 100% is not the goal of itself. Instead, you should use that code coverage report as a guide or as a map to which tests to write. So in this case, if you look at this test and you look at the report and you look inside each source file inside that report, you will see which lines were executed. In this case, I'm looking at the Redux store for the, that application. And I can clearly see that the case add to do was covered because my test really added free to do's. And in yellow, you see the switch statements that were not executed. And in red, you see the source lines that were not executed by this test. So you can see we need to write tests that delete to do, edit to do, complete to do, and so on. It becomes almost like a game 
where you just see the lines, but you have not tested, and you write an end-to-end -end test to hit those lines. So I've written more tests, and I get 99.26% code coverage just from end-to-end -end tests. Uh, except there's one tiny problem. I can see that one file missed something. So if I look inside that file, I can see a default case statement. This little file implements the view filter. Do I want to see all to-dos, active to-dos, or completed to-dos? And everything is fine. The end-to-end -end test is correct. It's just this default statement is not reachable from end-to-end -end interface, from the user interface, because my application is actually wired correctly. So in that case, I don't have to write end-to-end -end tests. I have to write a unit test that just executes this piece of code and hits that line. So I write unit test by importing that class directly and calling it with invalid filter. And Cypress can run unit tests just as well. In this case, there is no website, but it does execute your code, and there is code coverage information. And when I look at the report, I can see that I, in this particular unit test, I hit just that line. It was very targeted, specific test. And the cool thing is that Cypress can combine information from end-to-end -end tests and unit tests. And if you look at the combined report, you get 100% code coverage from your tests that run by Cypress. But wait, there is always more. So usually my web application is not just a static site. It's not just a web application. It has a backend. And if you're writing our front end in JavaScript, we probably are writing our backend in JavaScript using Node. So if you instrument your Node code, your server-side code, in practice, it's really easy. So here's how you do it. Instead of saying npm start and running Node server, you're saying start with coverage, where you run a tool called NYC, and you say instrument and start my node code. That's it. Behind the scenes, NYC will instrument every loaded file, so when my backend is running, it actually collects code coverage information. And Cypress implements middlewares where you can just import depending on the server that you're using, but can return that code coverage information. So when the test finish, Cypress code coverage plugin will ask, hey, give me everything from the backend side that was covered by this test. And then it just combines everything. And now you get full stack code coverage from the same end-to-end -end tests. In this case, 91%. Again, you don't have to exhaustively write the tests because end-to-end -end tests are extremely effective at covering all parts of system. Even more. Tomorrow, make sure not to uh, miss David's presentation. So he's advocating and shows examples and has libraries that show final state machines that can drive application. And if you can derive your application from final state machines, you can also derive your test automatically from that final state machine. It becomes a graph problem. So in this case, those tests are not written by me. Instead, I ask the final state machine, give me all the possible paths for a tic-tac-toe game, give me all the draws and a single win for X and a single win for O, and then Cypress runs those tests, and these tests were automatically generated. And I know that it's exhaustive set of tests because it's exhaustive set of paths in that finite state machine. Excellent. So, Please use code coverage not as a goal. Don't strive to kill yourself achieving 100% code coverage. Instead, look at the code coverage report and use missing lines as a guide to the test that you want to write. Don't look at the number by itself. Don't look at 92, 94, but instead, on every pull request, try to see if there is sudden change. If that number drops on a pull request, you probably have written code that you haven't tested or you omitted some necessary tests. So it's the delta in code coverage that matters, not the number itself. And finally, like, I'm really interested in looking beyond this uh, simple lines of code, code coverage number. So state machine code coverage is an important metric, I think. 
And the second question that people ask is that if I'm writing lots of tests, some of my tests are short, some tests are long, usually end-to-end -end tests are more realistic, so they're longer. How long is too long? So a lot of unit tests, a lot of short tests that we write are very short. And they follow a couple of steps. So first, they arrange some data. We may be importing a function, set up arguments. When they call that function with arguments, they act. And then they get results, and they have a single assertion. And I think those tests are short and have usually a single assertion, not because it's useful, but because most of tests so far that uh, we're running run in a terminal. So if a test fails, it becomes extremely, extremely difficult to debug a long test because it might have multiple assertions and multiple points of failure, because we would have to rerun things in terminal, maybe enable debug logs, concentrate on that particular test. So the terminal is not a good environment for running tests and debugging their failures. And I'm here to tell you it's OK to write longer tests if you have a better test runner. It's fine. Like, start writing tests now. Write realistic tests, a test that represents a typical use case where a human comes in and uses your system. In this case, I'm testing a medium clone, right? Where I'm writing a new blog post, I'm filling all the fields, and then submitting comment, because there is a command log on the left. Right now, I'm hovering over each command from my test, and it shows how the app looked during that step. I can even click on a command, open DevTools, and debug you know, XHR call, for example, in details and see everything that the application and my test performed. So if there is a failure somewhere in the middle of a test, I can debug it easily. I can see the behavior of the app, and I can understand why it failed even before that assertion at the end. And still, it's easy to get carried away. Everyone has their own time tolerance. But I would say that for me, anything longer than 20, 30 seconds is way too long of a test to work with effectively. Because every time I change something, it has to wait, go through 30 seconds of stuff before I know if my last command is passing or not. So here's a typical example. Imagine you're testing this multi-page form. So you fill all the fields on the first page, click Next, fill all the fields on the second page, click Next, and then fill everything on the last page before you actually you know, click Sign Up. I slowed down typing here just to prove my point. So this is way too long of a test. And it goes through the setup of multiple pages just to confirm that the Sign Up works. What can we do to make it better? We can split it into three tests, but wait. If I'm filling each page separately, how would my last page get all the data that it needs to sign up? Well, the way you do this is that each test ends with a checkpoint, almost like a game checkpoint where you save yourself and then respond later. Every new test doesn't start from the very beginning. Instead, it starts immediately from the previously saved checkpoint. Here's how it looks. In my application, if I'm running inside Cypress, I will expose the app reference variable. Now my tests can access the application. If they can do that, then I can write a first test that only fills the first page, goes to the second page, and stops. And at the very last command, after it stops, it grabs the window, grabs that app reference, accesses the Redux state, and makes sure that it's correct. It does deep equal and has a big object with all fields that I expect that form to fill. So I know my test goes through the page and ends in the same internal application state as I expect it to be. And here's the start of a second test. The very first command my test does, it goes to the window, grabs the application reference, and in a single call says, set your internal state into the checkpoint object and then it starts filling the fields. So here's the second test, and here's me hovering over just set state command. You see how application immediately switches from first page to the beginning of a second page, and its internal data is set exactly the same way as if it filled everything on the first page. 
but now I kind of like respawn at the start of a second page. And to the application, makes no difference if I fill the page or just re reset the state. Every state starts at the uh, last checkpoint of a previous, almost like relay racing. So I want to finish with a summary. Please, please, please document your code. If you're writing JavaScript and I look at your library and it doesn't have examples, I'll be very angry and I don't want to be angry. The code coverage that I've shown is not a target of itself. It's just a tool for you to write tests that cover something else and don't repeat themselves. And finally, don't accept slow tests. There are better ways to test so you don't have to wait for hours and hours and hours for them to finish. Thank you, and shoot for the stars. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gleb. We actually have a bunch of questions for you. Oh, wow. So <laughs> we are not going to be able to answer all of them, so let's start. What do you think about mu mutation tests? I love mutation. So mutation testing means you take the source code of your application and then randomly change variable or command. And then you run all your tests and you see if tests actually fail, if you actually det detect a mutation. And if they don't, that means your tests are not covering your application very well. So I'm all for exploring mutation. I didn't have time to implement it yet, but if you want to talk to me, I'm all for it. Next question, does Cypress support other browsers than Chrome? If not, then will be in future? Are there other browsers other than Chrome? I, I don't know <laughs> any. Um, no. So we support Chrome. We're coming up with supporting uh, Edge, Beta, and Brave because they actually run on Chromium. But we have a pull request with Firefox support. We have 3,000 full browser tests passing in Chrome. And out of 3,000 tests in Firefox, we have only 15 failings. So it's like this close, this close. We're coming out with Firefox support. Can I use Cypress to test React Native? Uh, no. So Cypress is only for anything that runs in the browser. If you haven't converted every, your React Native to the native app, you probably can test it in a browser. But after that, unfortunately, no. Checkpoints are only working with Redux. How would you do it with React context? So the checkpoints can, it's just an example that I used. Every apl application where you can control it, you, you can control it from end-to-end -end test and set its state or set its internal properties. So it should work with every platform. We have examples for Vue and Angular and anything under the sun. How to check if my test is good, the quality of it? I have doubts that I'm testing right, and it disappeared. No, it's there. Testing right things, right scenarios. I would say the person who doubts that they have written a good test and they're actually trying to see if it's good, it's already on a path to writing good tests because they're doubting themselves and they're trying to improve. I'm not sure what makes a good test, but I think if you review the test with your team, just like you review your production code, you can agree on a quality test. Does Cypress support integration in yes. did I skip one? CICD? So you can run Cypress on your machine locally on every continuous integration platform. Go to our docs. We have example and running on every platform, including GitLab. How does Cypress mock calls to and from API? It mocks them beautifully. Go to our docs. Look at the documentation for network stubbing. You can spy and stub on AJAX calls from your application. We're coming with a feature where you can use stub and spy everything, like everything. Is Cypress using Percy for uh, visual tests? Cypress is just a tool, and then there are plugins for visual testing. So Percy has written their own library to, to make sure that when Cypress runs, it sends the thing to Percy. AppliTools has written a library for Cypress as a plugin, so you can send things to AppliTools. There are open source image comparison libraries where Cypress can generate a snapshot, and that, that library will do visual diffing for you. So it's both commercial and open source things. Just go to our plugins page to find them. Is possible to test React TypeScript with Cypress? Yes. All right, <laughs> this is quick. We have problems running Cypress tests on uh, a CI. Requests oftentimes out when doing CY wait. Is this a known Cypress problem or could be something on our side? Do you remember I said that I write bad code, right? So I've written bad code and it fails, right? If you give us a reproducible example, we'll debug it and we'll fix it. Is Redux 
state commented to versioning system. If yes, isn't it too hard to maintain this test in long run as store is extended? Yes, so you commit it because I used it as an object. It, it's up to you what to do. But if you, for example, use just match snapshot, it's kind of the same thing. You have a trade off between large fixture objects versus the test. So you have to pick your battles. Is it possible to extract test results in EG? G unit format or code coverage in different formats? Yes. So the Cypress plugin save the coverage report in multiple formats, and you can configure additional ones so you can send it everywhere. I'm going to say last three questions. How do we E2E test and slow API? OK, you don't. If <laughs> your API calls end to end to end are slow, you mock them. Who should rate? Cypress test front end developer or the QA? I think the developer who's working on application should write end to end tests. I mean, QA can run them, write them, but when you're working on a tool, the tests help you to actually write better code right away. Last question, Glob. Uh, what about integration of Cypress with visual regression testing? Like taking screenshots when running some tests and comparing images? Just like I said, for Percy and Apply tools, there are plugins that use open source local tools that do image comparison. So just go to our plugins page, or we have a visual testing guide in our documentation that covers pretty much every scenario. Thank you so much, Gleb. As you can Thank see, you.